Florida first Sunday of Advent. <laughs> Feels very Florida in here, um, and if you if you weren't here at the 9 a.m. service, um, what we what we shared then is that this is actually cooler, if you can believe it, than it was at six this morning when breakfast was being served. Uh, there was a our our heating and air system sometimes can't keep up with these quick <laughs> changes in weather. It was 30 earlier this week, and now it's you know a balmy 80 or something out there. So. Um, let me open us in a word of prayer, and uh, we're going to get started with this presentation. Please pray with me. Loving God, we are grateful for the gifts that you give us, especially the gifts of this community, a community of faith that we can be encouraged by, that we can do life together with, and of course, that we can learn with. We ask, O oh God, that your spirit would animate our conversation today, that it would uh, be a gift to us and a gift to this world, that it would somehow help us prepare for this wonderful and miraculous season of Advent. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, uh, good morning again. If you don't know me, my name is Chris Holmes. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm also the scholar in residence. And this is a long-standing tradition at this church. I don't know exactly how many years. It's been here as long as I've been here, and it was here before I was here. Uh, of We provide a, a, a brief lecture uh, the week before the wonderful performance of a Christmas uh, concert on the following week. So next week is the Christmas concert, and this week is our uh, presentation. If, if you haven't seen it already, if you can't read the, the slides, we're going to be talking about uh, Vivaldi's Gloria today, which will be performed next week. Uh, and uh, as has always been the tradition, this is a, a co-taught session between the scholar in residence and our organist and director of worship. Uh, in this case, it's... Uh, Tom Barra, who is uh, going to be uh, teaching alongside of me. This is a little bit of what we hope to do today. Uh, we've already welcomed you, so check that off your list. Um, I thought it would be a, a, a fun, just to take a few moments to introduce Tom. Some of you know Tom really well. Some of you have never met Tom. Some of you think that Tom is the coolest person ever, and certainly after today, you're going to think that. But we'll do a, a very brief introduction to Tom, uh, featuring a few of Tom's favorite things. Um, uh, and then uh, I'm going to hand over the reins to Tom, uh, who will uh, talk through uh, Vivaldi's life and some of his compositions. Hopefully, if the, the, the technology fairies uh, are being uh, helpful, all of our YouTube clips will work. Um, and then I'll bring us uh, to a close with uh, a bit more about the text of Vivaldi's Gloria, its origins, its history, uh, as well as some of its theological vision. So that's our plan, uh, all, all before uh, the 11 o'clock service. And Tom is going to duck, uh, duck out around 1030 to go uh, get ready for our 11 o'clock service. So if you see him leave in a huff, it's not because of anything I've said. Um, it was a prearranged huff leaving. Um, so, uh, so let's let's do this rapid fire, Tom. Uh, introducing Tom. There, there's Tom. There's two pictures of Tom. So a few of Tom's favorite things. Rapid fire succession. Okay. Favorite food. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, favorite year in school. Uh, freshman year of uh, college, I was in the same studio as Dan Barra. We were both organ students in the same studio, and oh. that was my favorite year of college. And you happen to know this Dan Barra character. I happen to know. Okay. And you share a last name. Um, what is your favorite vacation or type of vacation? Uh, going on car camping trips with my family. We're pretty good at it. Um, our best one was during COVID, we did a kind of the eastern uh, quarter or quadrant of the country over four weeks, including a stop through here. Um, so that's nice. kind of like what we like to do, yeah. Nice. Uh, favorite instrument? <laughs> Actually, the voice. <laughs> How about the voice? To be a little provocative okay. there. Ooh. I think if any instrument is doing it well, you're, you're doing it like a singer. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Favorite child? <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, you don't have to answer that. Um, uh, what is your favorite thing about working at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta? I think it's evolving. Um, uh, coming here at the beginning, I met a, a sample of group that was my hiring committee, 
And I, I told the committee then that I was in love, that the, the sampling of people that were on the committee, the passion they brought for this place and the accomplishments they had in various ages or regions of their lives was just really intoxicating. Um, so I, as I'm here, having that expand as I get to know different people and make friends, I think that's gonna be a long-term process. But to be honest, like immediately, my most fun thing has been accompanying the choir. Yeah, that's been really fun. Awesome. Okay, well, that's just a little bit about Tom. Grab him after the 11 o'clock service uh, if you want to hear his answer to his favorite child. Um, well, well by the that. way, I saw that picture, which was on Google Images, but that, that girl there, oh, yeah. she is now the organist at St. Philip's. So that's, that's really, that, that makes me feel good. She was a student at Interlochen. That was at Interlochen. I was one of her first organ teachers, and, and that was during the summer. There. And believe it or not, that was only six months ago. <laughs> Before he started here, it just, the Atlanta weather just changed things. All right, Tom, come on up. All right. I'll give you the, the clicker. Oh, okay. And I have to use the clicker, and I'll be able to see this. Mm -hmm. Okay, yay. Um, the Red Priest, any of you heard that, um, to refer to Vivaldi? He had red hair. Um, <laughs> so uh, he was known as the Red Priest. His dad also had red hair. Um, and he was a priest. Uh, he, he was a Venetian composer, uh, first born of a poor family. His dad was a barber, I think a baker, and then also a musician, was Vivaldi's first teacher. and. Uh, a way for social mobility, if you were the, in a poor family, is often to join the priesthood. So he joined the priesthood. I, if I were to look at the evidence and interject my judgment on it, I think he was a reluctant priest. Um, he, he went through the different stages of, of the progression um, and was ordained, but he got uh, permission not to have to administer mass. Um, it was because of the exertion of it. Uh, so I guess it's exerting, but I, I, I'm getting the sense that he liked the setting and the education of it, but uh, that was probably the extent of it. So, um, so he's a priest. Uh, he and his dad um, played and were involved in the music of St. Mark's Basilica. Have any of you? Um, been part of that. That's, um, I haven't in person, but through my studies, that's a, a cornerstone or a, a pillar of Western music, the music that happened in that cathedral, very influential on the course of Western music, um, starting with before Vivaldi. Um, uh, so th that's important. Um, Let me continue. So if we go on to the next slide. Oh, that, is that out of order? Let's look at, um, there one? we go, yeah. <laughs> there. Uh, very important part of Vivaldi's output and development is the, uh, <laughs> I should practice, Ospedal della Pietà. How did I do with any Italian speakers? Um, I like cognates. <laughs> um, so Ospedale. Uh, I, I think is tr loosely translated as hospice. Um, it was one of four uh, institutions, um, hospitals or hospices, um, administered by the, the city of uh, Venice. And um, this one in particular uh, was an orphanage. And um, at the, during the culture of Venice at this time, it's a port city. It's um, a lot of tourists, a lot of sailors coming in. There's also um, birthright and, and transferring wealth to generation to generation. Uh, it wasn't a system of uh, the first male heir receiving wealth. or um, Because of that, there's a lot of um, people chose not to stay married and, and the illicit life of um, what you could imagine in, in, a, in a city like that led to um, a lot of uh, mothers who couldn't care for their kids. So there was a lot of orphans at the time. Hmm. And um, at the, 
Hospitala de Pieta, they had that building that you see at the top is no longer there, but I understand there is still, as a monument, the, um, the hole in the wall where, <laughs> where mothers would bring their babies and uh, leave them, often with some kind of a token, maybe like a half of a, of a coin or something, so that maybe if their luck changed, they can come and reclaim their, um, their orphan. Uh, so the, the children there uh, would work to learn a trade, and the boys would leave to, to go uh, be with master um, tradesmen pretty early on. But the girls stayed and um, took music lessons, many of them. And there became this, um, through confluence of the Holy Spirit, this place became a world famous for how good the ensemble was. And they were all girls. Um, they, uh, uh, some of them stayed for a long time. Some of them, um, as they, this renown built upon itself, um, it became in a way the, the, the identity or the reason for being for this place. So dignitaries, noble people from all over Europe would come to hear services. They were actually kind of like concerts of these women performed. The women performed behind a veil, which added to the allure, I think. Like, who are these women, children, through uh, adults that are playing music that's so exquisite and, and amazing? How is this even possible? And listen to how great they are. Um, became part of, part of this. And this, inter this is interrelated with them hiring professional musicians to teach the instruments and then also to compose the music for these services. Um, some of the, the, the girls would stay and they would eventually become teachers themselves, but they would also, there was a certain prestige to being so good, so they would hire, and that's where Vivaldi comes in. Um, Vivaldi, uh, he was very ambitious and um, had already uh, started to make a name for himself by leaving Venice and, and becoming well known for opera. He wrote, uh, I think he's, if you listen to his notes, he was uh, impresario or responsible for 90 different opera. Um, I don't think, we haven't found that many pieces that he actually wrote. He uh, it's more like we've seen 50, but even that, 50 operas is, is, is amazing. And if you think at the time, opera was the it. It was the IMAX theater of the time. <laughs> It's where you, or, the, or maybe even the, the Mercedes Hall, whatever, of the time. It, was, it brought in the best technology, the best art, the best compositions, the, the most theatrics. And Vivaldi uh, had a knack for that. Um, so he brought that skill and that reputation back to the Pietà as this uh, reluctant priest, opera star, composer coming back. You can imagine that relationship with the Pietà was a little strained. Um, he was kind of a, a renegade spirit in some ways, he, he, um, but he was really good, and he had a really good relationship with the, the girls there. So over a big part of his career, you can see from, uh, uh, I think, 1703 to 1715 was the first stint, and then off and on uh, throughout another stint, uh, 1723 to 1740. He was there as their violin teacher and then also as a composer. And he, super, huge amount of pieces that he composed for uh, the Pietà. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, I'll actually back up. Um, you can kind of get a sense. That's the old building on the river. This is a later picture, a painting. Um, and this was uh, the end of the 18th century. Um, after Vivaldi was there in a new building. And I think this was maybe for, um, to entertain the czar coming in and visiting, and, and that's a sense of the newer space. And you can kind of see dignitaries walking around in the bottom there, just interesting. And there's nothing now left? Uh, I have a, I think, no, I don't think there is. There's a plaque for Vivaldi, and there's the newer building, um, where so not the one that he would have taught in, but the one that replaced it. Uh, but I, I don't think it exists now. This one? Uh, this gets, that's what keeps showing up. There we go. Uh, form follows function. 
So this is great. How many, any uh, teachers out there amongst us? No teachers in this whole group? Oh, oh some, OK. One of the big things for teachers, uh, music teachers, we have to do it kind of automatically, but my wife is a math teacher also. Differentiation, you heard that kind of, where you have a, a group of people and they're at different abilities and, and you have to provide a vibrant um, experience for everybody. So imagine you're Vivaldi, this opera star composer, and you're, you're, you have an orphanage of girls, some older and very accomplished and some newer foundlings. Um, differentiation, what are you going to come up with? And this is what I said, form follows function. Uh, Vivaldi's claim to fame, um, is, how's the mic, is it good enough? Okay. Um, is this form called the concerto. Um, and uh, the concerto, it's a, we still have that. We have down the family tree of evolution. It's turned into, um, well, we have, as 20th century audiences, or 21st century audiences, we have access to the whole canon. And we have the heroic soloist concertos with the tortured artists doing virtuoso stuff. We have Mozart, which is more of a dialogue. But during this time, the Baroque concerto was a little different. Um, concerto loosely means like the coming together or friendly rivalry or juxtaposition of groups of instruments. So with this, and this is going to be important for the pieces that you're going to hear, so this is kind of coming together, we have um, a section that would have everybody play. And that, um, so if you can imagine, you got the younger students, the younger girls, and the advanced, and they start and they lay out the, the building blocks of what the piece is going to be. Um, and that padded, that full section, is called the ripiano, um, which is a word that you can see in other contexts. I think it means padded or stuffed. Or, um, again, I like cognates, and, and I, if I can recognize part of a word, I always feel really good. But if you go to a restaurant and you see something with ripiani in it, it means it's filled with something good. Um, uh, cannoli, ripiani, de crema, de, 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 something. Um, so this was the full part. And that section of the piece was harmonically static. It would outline a scale or a chord and kind of be set. It's not going to be unstable or, or go to another area. Um, it was not as hard to play as the contrasting sections, which is the concertino, which would have been played by the advanced students. And that section has a, a, quite a lot more virtuosity to the texture. Also, that part of the piece, when you listen to the concerto, is going to travel. It's going to take you from your stationary um, key that was laid out by the, uh, the, the ripiano section to a new key. And you can kind of travel to different spots. And when you arrive there, everyone comes back in for a restatement of the theme. Um, OK, so let's listen. This is the flute concerto first movement. And let me get my, um, and when I did this, I, I get ads. So you can see, I don't know if this is my account. You can see what I'm interested in. Oh, it's mine. Oh, it's yours. You can see what you're interested in. Oh, somehow you avoided Maybe you paid me. No, that's SNL. That's me. Uh, OK. This is, so, <laughs> so if you hear, uh, let's listen to the beginning. This is the ripiano. And this uh, concerto, which you'll hear next week, is Il Gardalino, um, which is, I think, the uh, goldfinch. And it's with flute and, flute and uh, uh, birds, that's kind of a nice connection. Uh, and as an aside, Vivaldi was also really famous, maybe because of his opera background or um, in programmatic music, having the instruments represent different scenes. If any of you know the um, Four Seasons and, and have heard his sonnet that he wrote with it, the music is, corresponds with his words very um, deliberately and very literally. Um, so here we go, and um, we're just going to play for the first um, 14 seconds, I think, or until I say stop. So this is the ripiano. It's going to lay everything out, and if you listen, it's just uh, it's just a chord, uh, pretty much, or just one one harmony. All right, let's try this. <laughs> Yeah. 
and stop. It feels like the piece is done. It's just like this sort of, um, now the flute's gonna go and do the fancy soloist stuff. And then other parts, other concertino parts, he's gonna be joined with the violin and they're gonna do fancy stuff. Um, what, did it say 1027 up there? At the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, uh, the choir's gonna be like, <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna start to um, s speed dial this through. Um, so you can hear, hear that layout and you can hear the, um, well, you'll will next week. It's really easy to follow. Uh, now, you, I was inspired by Tony's sermon today, and I was thinking, what if I could like lay out something and do instant Vivaldi? Because Vivaldi wrote over 500 concerti, and then and Stravinsky even said, well, he just wrote the same piece 500 times <laughs> as a disparaging thing. But if you think of having to do the output and, and writing a piece for the student this year, oh, let me write you a piece. And then you do a bassoon piece. And oh, you play the mandolin. Listen to a mandolin. That piece. You know, it's uh, something different each time with the same kind of formula, but it kind of works. But um, uh, was that hymn for anybody at the 9 o'clock service, that first hymn, was it familiar or was it a new to this group? It's, I grew up with it, so it seemed like an old favorite, but Tony kind of said, oh, it's Tom's fault that we did that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I'm just teasing. <laughs> um, so if we were to do it, the, the opening um, sounds very much in a key. Now, if you took that first thing, you could have your own ripiano. Um, And then you could, um, uh, that could maybe be your piano. you could kind of do that. Uh, and then after that, you would have your, your soloist that would do a Vivaldi lick. And one of the things to listen to is I have to compress this. In the solo section, Vivaldi provided a texture and a style that composers all over Europe wanted to copy. And it's kind of a Baroque rock and roll. <laughs> um, I think there's Red Priest, it sounds like, Sounds like a rock band, heavy metal. But if you could think of violins, they would go, and you'd get this really brilliant texture over simple harmonies, really easy to follow. Um, that's the Vivaldi sound which other composers would take, and you'll hear that in the solo sections. They often would follow these sequences that were also really influential in, in European music. So if I were to take that, um, um, then you can kind of do it, the Vivaldi kind of texture. And then you maybe go into a, a sequence. Uh. Um, something like that. And you'll hear that. <laughs> it's so bubbly, you'll hear it a million times. And it's like an old friend, but really important to the way music goes. And really uh, familiar to our sensibilities of what we would listen to. because. Lots of rhythm section. So if you can think of production of pop music with lots of stuff, but the chords themselves weren't moving that fast. So it's, it's, it really suits our sensibilities. Now we can take that style and concerto writing, let's take it from a specific piece to a mindset or a way of life. And you can take concerto, I'm a concerto composer, and you can take that technique and you can apply it to a bunch of different things. So as you'll hear the flute concerto first, and I think the, it's really easy to follow, I think, for everybody. You'll, but then when you listen to the first movement of the Vivaldi, you can kind of hear the same sense. You'll hear a ripiano section, a fanfare that's in a, in a steady key, and then it'll change texture slightly with that Vivaldi rock and roll. <laughs> that will kind of take you somewhere, and then you come back to the rip piano section, and then the choir comes in. So if we listen to the beginning of the Vivaldi, listen to the rip piano, and you'll hear it with uh, trumpet and, and oboe prominently. Now stop for a second, just pause it. So we just heard the rip piano. Now we're going to hear that kind of that rock and roll style, and it's going to modulate. It's not going to actually go anywhere because it's going to come right back to where we started. But when it comes back, it's going to feel like we've gone somewhere and, and arrived, and that's when the choir comes in. So now we'll just hear it through. All right. Maybe. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to catch up, guys.
traveling. It's easy to follow, though. The courts aren't moving fast. And now we're back to where we started, but the court. Now listen to this. And you've got the root piano underneath it. So it's like a concerto, but it's a choir piece. OK, no, that's. I would love to stay here for the rest of the hour. <laughs> uh, but really, if, I don't, uh, if we don't do the run through with the choir, <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen at the next service. So I do that. Uh, thank you awesome. very much. Thank you, Tom. All right. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you. If you've been with me for more than a, a minute, you know that Tom probably has more musical ability in his small toe <laughs> than I have in my entire body for the future of forever. But I'm good at talking about text, so that's what I'm going to do uh, for the rest of the time uh, before worship. And I'm just going to start, I'm going to give these to Katie. Um, these, are the, these are the actual lyrics of Vivaldi's Gloria. Uh, so as I'm talking about this text, it will be, will be helpful for you to uh, maybe fo follow along. And, uh, and, uh, and th these are the actual texts, the, the lyrics from the, the musical score, the vocal musical score that they'll be performing next week. So if you want to put them in your pocket and bring it back next week, uh, you can see that. Uh, please note, it's been a minute since I've translated Latin. So uh, if there are any translations into English, please be gracious in reminding me of that. Uh, but I think I did OK. Um, so and, and I, I need to probably be my own clicker. Um, so a couple just uh, historical details about this text. Um, it was likely written in uh, 1713 to 1717. So right in the middle or the second two thirds of that period that he was living and working in the Pieta, right? That, that uh, Tom just talked about. Um, it's only about 85 words in Latin. It's a very short piece in terms of the word count. Um, but it's divided into 12 movements. And so that's on the sheet that I've given you. These are the 12 movements. Uh, so you can be looking for the transitions uh, in the music. And is the, and as the, is the case with uh, a, a lot of sacred music, the, the way in which these 85 words are stretched for an entire 45 minutes is in the series of repetition and the series of building, as we've even seen uh, just now with the, the snippet that Tom gave us. Uh, it opens with a quotation of Luke 2.14. Um, and we could think about this as a mix of, of praise, a mix of supplication, and even a little bit of a profession of faith. And what I want to do is help us understand just a little bit about how ancient this text is. In previous lectures, it's been my job to sort of like tease out the biblical and theological themes. Um, and I'm going to do some of that at the end. But what's really fascinating is that when we hear Vivaldi's Gloria performed, we are hearing one of the oldest Christian hymns that we know of, right? We are hearing the, the remnants of uh, the echoes of one of the oldest hymns that we can think of. So um, if, we, if we look at uh, this, this is a, 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 a something known as the Great Doxology. Uh, the Great Doxology is a text that uh, was originally an ancient hymn of praise to the Trinity, to all three members of the Trinity. If you look at uh, the version in the Greek, Greek Orthodox tradition of this uh, Gloria, of this Great Thanksgiving, you'll see a very clear Trinitarian Theology. It, it praises God the Father, it praises God the Son, and then, yes, it, add, it adds God the Holy Spirit. In the text that we will hear next week from Vivaldi's Gloria, if you look at line at movement 12, this is all the Holy Spirit gets in Vivaldi's version, is with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. That's it, period. So it's sort of like, it's sort of like added in. But originally in the second, third, fourth, fifth centuries, when the early church was really trying to figure out its understanding of the Trinity, how can God be three in one and one in three? This became really a, a prominent feature of the great Thanksgiving or the great doxology. Um, 
So it was a hymn, to the, hymn of praise to the Trinity. Uh, it is possible that it, it, it originated as early as the second century. So within 100 years of, uh, or 150 years of the early church. Um, and uh, it was originally written in Greek. And this is, according to some scholars, one of the, one of the only or the latest or the last examples of uh, psalmi idiotsi, uh, a, a, a personalized psalm. So uh, it, it probably originated as the work of an individual or of a community that then had sort of a, a more widespread and wide-reaching uh, impact. Uh, and so we go from this second century document uh, into uh, a, a recommendation by, by this, the Apostolic Constitutions. And I'm sure everybody was reading this in, over the weekend in preparation. It, it's, it's like just about as popular as Dan Brown's books. It's bestseller. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, this, was a, this was a text from the third or fourth century, and it is a, a sort of a composite or a, a collection of teachings about how the church will be ordered, how the church will do its life together in the third and fourth centuries. And the great doxology, the, the, the great uh, hymn towards, towards God's glory, is recommended as a daily morning prayer. And so here is that text. You can see uh, just quickly how similar it is to Vivaldi's text, to the text that we'll hear sung next week. Glory be to God in the highest and upon earth peace, goodwill among men. That's the quotation from Luke 2. We praise you. We sing hymns to you. We bless you. We glorify you. We worship you by your great high priest, you who art the true God, who art the one unbegotten, the only inaccessible being, for your great glory, O Lord and heavenly King, O God the Father Almighty, O Lord God, take us away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou who sittest at the right hand of the Father, have mercy upon us, for thou only art holy, thou only art Christ, Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And then there's a, a slight alter, uh, alternation offered uh, where it would be the, to the Father of Christ, the Immaculate Lamb, who takes away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. You that sits upon the cherubim, for you alone are holy. You alone are the Lord Jesus, the Christ of the God of all created nature, and our King by whom glory, honor, and worship be to you. Amen. That's a mouthful, right? Lots of, lots of glory, lots of praise, lots of gr uh, gratitude. We see even in this version, this version would have been written in Latin, uh, that we, we, we see the, the, the balance of praise and thanksgiving, even with the supplication, pray for us, intercede for us, take away our sins, right? This is uh, a balance that we see. So again, this text is a third or a fourth century text. Um, and then if we, uh, if we go even a little bit further, um, this text is alluded to or mentioned in the early Christian writer, St. Basil, uh, who I know, uh, not just a spice for cooking, St. Basil was an important Greek theologian uh, in the, in the f probably the fourth century. Um, and he mentions this great Thanksgiving, not by quoting it, but just by alluding to it in his argument about the Holy Spirit. So this is a work that is devoted to, uh, to explaining and proving that the Holy Spirit should be considered equal with the Father and the Son in the, in the understanding of that relationship. And he sort of just uses it as an aside. He says, you know, if you need any more evidence about the Holy Spirit being, being holy and being uh, d uh, part of the divine nature, just, just realize that these people have been praying this as a morning prayer for hundreds of years, right? It's just like this aside uh, and a reflection of how long standing uh, it is. Probably, for me, the most fascinating piece of history with this great doxology, if you see this, this text uh, on the right, this is a, a, a picture, a, a, a facsimile copy of Codac, uh, Codex Alexandrinus. Um, and what is, why is Codex Alexandrinus important? It's one of two uh, codices that contains the entire Greek Bible. So the Old Testament that has been translated into Greek, the New Testament, obviously, in Greek. It's in a codex form, which means it's in a book form as opposed to a scroll form. And at the back of this, uh, this manuscript is a version of the great doxology. 
It's included in, the, in this biblical manuscript, uh, again, underscoring just how significant it was for the early church. Um, and then if we are moving forward a little bit longer, a little bit more further in the history of interpretation, this is probably my, my favorite part. Uh, Hilary of uh, Portier uh, is the one who we think was responsible for translating the original Greek into Latin. And what you need to know about Hillary is that he was exiled to the, the Greek East uh, by the Emperor Constantius um, as a part of the persecution. And when he was allowed to come back, he brought with him the Greek hymnic tradition. He brought with him uh, this, this, this practice of writing and singing hymns in Greek. And so he, uh, he brought back uh, this hymn, we think, and translated this hymn along with other hymns into uh, Latin. And his nickname, which I think this would make a great um, uh, uh, you know, fantasy football name, uh, or if we're getting ready for March Madness, a draft name, the Hammer of the Arians. Uh, what a name. He, the Arians were those that, uh, in, in their former fashion, wanted to say that Jesus was slightly subordinate to the Father was not quite equal with the father. Uh, and, uh, and Hillary was having none of that. So uh, could also be a really cool back tattoo, uh, uh, hammer of the Aryans. So eventually, uh, this gets, uh, it makes its way even to Northern Ireland in something known as the Bangor uh, and Tiffany. Uh, and then the, the ninth century Frankish text, we think, is the, the sort of the source of Vivaldi's lyrics. The, the Latin lyrics come from that, that text. So it's a very old, old, uh, old piece. And why does this matter? Why is this more than just a historical data point? I think, I think two things that are really worth noting. The first is that long before Vivaldi put it to music, uh, it was born in worship. So sometimes when we've done these lectures in the past, there sometimes is this interesting relationship between sacred music, which is often performed in an opera house or somewhere independent of the church, uh, and music that happens within the church. And this piece, uh, its prehistory says it's born in the church. It started as something like a private prayer that eventually became a part of the practice of the early church, uh, a widespread practice, perhaps um, for the morning prayer. Um, there's other traditions that put it at other parts of the day, but a very significant piece. And then I think the second part of, of why this matters is that we see diverse versions of it in contemporary communities of faith. So there is, uh, when, when, when Tom and I were talking about it, he said, I just knew Vivaldi's Gloria from, from the, the Latin Mass. It was just a part of what, what happened in regular Catholic Mass throughout the year. Um, but there's also a, a Greek version. The lyrics are slightly different. Uh, we, we see uh, the, the reception of this, this piece in Lutheran traditions as well as Episcopalian. So it's a, it's a really uh, important piece of, of worship and an important piece of our uh, life together. And then I think the, the second piece that is worth uh, pointing out is the sort of the theological vision, which I'm going to say more about two things. Uh, but in general, the, this idea of Jesus as the Lamb of God, Jesus as the one who sits at the right hand of the Father, um, that, that Hillary was saying, we need to exalt the, the divinity of Jesus. Uh, and then the fact that we have one of the ways that you would respond to these, these sort of what we would, we would call heresies in the third, fourth, fifth centuries was not just to write tomes of theology, but to sing praise, uh, to structure the worship life in a way that worships all members of the Trinity equally. And so um, let, me, let me say a few things about the theological vision. The first is it opens with thanks. It opens with thanks. We give you glory. We praise you. We give you thanks. Uh, and uh, it really reminds us of this, this quotation from Meister Eckhart that if the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it will be enough, right? That the Vivaldi opens with this fundamental basic prayer of thank you. We give you praise. We give you thanks. Thank you. Um, the second thing that, that I want to think about is 
this idea, this image of the Lamb of God. It's, it's mentioned uh, just, just a couple of places uh, in this hymn, but it's a deeply uh, important theme in New Testament writings. Uh, it is mostly associated with the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation. And so the Lamb of God is, is that, that idea that, that Jesus takes the sins of the world and runs them out of God's presence so that God can fully and, and intimately dwell with God's people. Uh, so there's this uh, intercessory role of Jesus. There's this salvific role of Jesus that is uh, illustrated by the Lamb of God. And then, because of my, my brain has been on Revelation for years now, uh, when the Lamb of God, the slaughtered lamb, is one of the favorite ways that the book of Revelation refu- re- refers to Jesus, which has this sort of salvific or cultic understanding of the lamb who takes away the sin, but it also reflects that Jesus in the book of Revelation is fundamentally nonviolent in his resistance. That, that even as he's victorious and he has a sword of the spirit or a sword that comes out of his mouth, which is really weird, uh, ultimately the way that the, the book of Revelation recognizes Jesus is as this, this lamb who was willing to resist to the point of death uh, and yet is victorious even in that death. And the final thing is we... Uh, prepare to wrap up this presentation and go to worship or go somewhere else if you've already been at worship, uh, is this line uh, that we see near the end of Vivaldi's Gloria. You alone are holy. You alone are Lord. You alone, most high Jesus Christ. Uh, this, this is a, a refrain that, that is, is fundamental to the Christian tradition. It's fundamental to the Reformed tradition that says uh, we recognize that God is the Lord of our lives, uh, that in life and in death we belong to God, and that there are all sorts of other little G gods uh, and little L lords that would compete for our attention. And so this is the profession of faith aspect of the Gloria, that, that we are saying in, in our voices that as we receive this, this song next week, um, let it be true. May, may you be the Lord of my life. May you be the center of my life as I go on in this Advent season. So that's uh, the theological vision in five minutes. Um, it is, it is uh, 10.50, and if you have questions that don't have to do with flutes or voices or organs, I'd be happy to answer them uh, if there are any questions from, from you all. Seeing none, uh, you can ask Tom the musical questions next week. Uh, thank you all for, this, uh, for joining us today. We'll, we'll see you at worship.